We're continuing talking about spiritual atmospheres, and namely the effects of words on atmospheres. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 2 and 3 says, For you know that you were Gentiles, carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So, according to this verse, when the Holy Spirit speaks, the Lordship of Jesus will be exalted. And also, by extension, we said in the past, the Word of God will be exalted because Jesus is the Word. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And the same was in the beginning with God, and the Word became flesh. So, Jesus is the Word made flesh. So, the Holy Spirit speaks, it will always exalt the Word of God, and it will ex exalt the person of Jesus and the Lordship of Jesus. And we're continuing looking at some verses that I asked the, I was asking the Lord about. What about this scripture? Were, were the demonic spirits that Jesus encountered, were they not exalting his Lordship? And then on further example, you see, or further examination, rather, you see that they weren't. Mark chapter 1, verses 23 through 25 is another example. It says, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we had to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you not come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. Uh, first thing I want to point out from this verse that jumped out at me, that the devil was in church. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we don't often think in terms of the devil being at church. It was the synagogue, which is the was the expression of the church at that time. Uh, 2 Peter 2, verse 1 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be pro false teachers among you. And they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. In Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31, Paul is about to leave the Ephesian believers, and this is his depart, departing message for him. He says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So he said, From the outside, savage wolves will come in. But also in verse 30, he says, Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears uh, at verse 30 in the J.B. Phillips translation says yes even among you men will arise speaking perversions of the truth trying to draw away the disciples and make them followers of themselves so you see you kind of see the the origin of error you know, it, it all comes from this desire to be different and to pull people to yourself. If you want to isolate yourself, Proverbs 18 says, you know, if you he that isolates himself rages against all sound judgment and he seeks his own, he seeks his own desires. He has his own agenda. And so if we're going to if we're going to try to isolate and pull people to ourselves, we'll have to teach something different. We'll get in this uh trap of trying to come up with something different in order to draw people away from the mainstream we even have to watch and, and so-called non-denominational circles i like what my spiritual father he referred to us as interdenominational even though we wasn't part of a particular denomination we still recognize the body of christ and the, what they had to contribute it's just not me and jesus got our own thing going but the main thing I want to point out is, is he's saying they will arise among you. So we have to be watchful of that. First of all, in church, you can't just, if just because somebody's in church doesn't mean you just put all your guards down and just open yourself totally up to everything they say and do and open up to relationship even. You know, we, we have to, we have to watch these things. You know, and I've made that mistake in the past. The Holy Spirit will give me a check about something, and I will override that leading because, well, they should be okay. They're in church. Well, in any, any healthy church, there should be people at all levels. You should have new converts, and you may have people that's just come out of things, and that's, that's, that's good in that sense, and let them sit under the Word for a while, and, and, and a lot of that stuff will drop off more than likely if they'll stay with it. But there's some people that's been in church for years and years and years and just refuse, refuse to repent. 
And you have to follow that inward witness and just don't go and just blindly follow somebody because they're in church. And that same goes with what you hear in church. I'll say that about myself. You judge what you hear by, based on the Word of God. Now, you need to take the whole counsel of the Word, you know, and you need not just some one scripture that you twisted and stretched. You know, you gotta, you got to line it up with the entire body of scripture and, and its historical context, and you got to consider all these different things. But if you do that, and something I say doesn't line up with the Word of God, you know, just throw it out. And if you tell me about it and, and, and I see where I'm wrong about it, I'll repent publicly. I don't claim to have all the light on it. Next thing is Christian television or Christian meetings. You just can't just trust everything you hear. But sadly, a lot of people are like birds. They just open their mouth and just everything that's thrown in there from Christian television or Christian meetings or things like that, that, that has Christian in the title, they just accept blindly. But you can't do that. You have to judge what you're hearing. And then and thirdly, here's, a, here's one that's interesting. And it's something I've really wrestled with over the years. <laughs> it is the, the issue of proximity. If the Lord gives you a check about somebody, I've had the Lord, you know, say, I don't need to be part of that. I don't need to listen to that or whatever. I don't need to be in relationship with that, whatever. And then look and they're in close proximity to somebody I respect. Well, you can't just override that. You can't override that leading. And, and, you know, it could be that's just not a relationship he's building with you. But sometimes it's something, something's wrong. And that leads us to the next point. We can't pick up other Christians, even ministers, error. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. So we only, we only follow them as they follow in what lines up with Christ and the nature of Christ and who we know him to be. Brother Hagin said that some mistakes people make is they follow the minister too close. And in, in cases where ministers have fallen, the, their followers fell too because they followed too close. No, you need to judge, you know, and here, here's the deal. <laughs> we, we all have blind spots. You know, and, and there's, you don't have the same degree of mercies for other people's blind spots as you do your own. You know, I know I have blind spots. But what if we're not careful, we'll just go around picking up everybody's error. We, we need to glean truth from everybody, but not pick up their error. And see, to them, it's a blind spot. But to you, God's already dealt with you about that. And now if you go backwards and pick up that error from them, you won't have the same degree of mercy and grace as they do because it is a, it's truly a blind spot to them. Like I said, this is not a judgment thing. It's is because we all have them. If you don't think you do, you're, you're in more trouble than you think. <laughs> so we have to not pick up others' blind spots. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 in the Amplified Bible says, However, we possess this precious treasure, the divine light of the gospel, in frail human vessels of earth, that the grandeur and the ex exceeding greatness of the power may be shown to be from God and not from ourselves. That, that word vessels uh, is the word astrokinoi, and it's talked about this pottery. I got this little nugget from Rick Renner. He said that they had pottery that looked really good, and they painted it up real nice, and, but, but it was real fragile and easily, easily broken. <laughs> uh, actually, that, that word astrokinoi is where the word, our, uh, word ostracized comes from, because back in that day, they would they would vote on little pieces of broken pottery and whenever they voted somebody out of citizenship in the in the in the nation they would vote on this piece of pot pottery and so that it is said they were ostracized so that's not part of my lesson but i just thought thought it was interesting <laughs> but so so we we're in these frail frail vessels and we but we can't we, and we also can't let that trip us up either you know, to find out that these people are human should not trip us up. And, and it to say, you know, and, and, and I'll talk about the proximity thing. There are people that were in close proximity to people that I didn't care for and I knew to be in error. And I wanted to reject them outright. And the Holy Spirit said, no, listen to what they have to say on this subject. And you got to take it for a case by case basis. You know, you may, they may be okay that today. 
So, so we have to be led. That's the key. And we can't go by externals and who they're close to and who they're not close to. Because there was some, like, like one particular minister. I got, I listened to him and was blessed. For whatever reason, he didn't pick up the, on the flakiness of the person he was associating with. You know, and, I, and, and pray for him. Pray for him when you see him in association. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to judge anybody. We're not judging their heart and ju judging their motive. We just we just have to judge what we hear, and we got to be led by the Spirit. And the next thing that we get from this account is he was trying to invoke the name without lordship. Let's read it again. He said, "Let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth, did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God." And Jesus rebuked him, saying, "Be quiet and come out of him." See, there, there was an uh, there was an occult belief, occultic belief back in that day, that if you said enough names, if you knew enough names, that you could manipulate the spirit realm. <laughs> so this demon is trying to manipulate Jesus by using as many. I mean, look at this. You know, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, you are the Holy One of God, yeah. and and we see the same thing with uh, the seven sons of Sceva. In the book of Acts, let's look at it. Acts, Acts 19, verses 13 through 16. Then some itinerant Jewish exorcists took upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over those whom had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped upon him and overpowered him and prevailed against him. So that they fled out of the house naked and wounded, and, and that was the, that was the custom. They would go around collecting names from from the occult and all these religions and of angels and all these. <laughs> that that's what the these were occultic believers. They what they were believers in the occult, I should say rather, not believers. So they figured, hey, they found another name, Jesus and Paul. So we'll use those two names and maybe we can use it on this evil spirit. But ended up, you know, the evil spirit overtook him. But see, they were trying to appropriate the name without relationship. We see the same thing in the account of the demoniac, the gathering demoniac. Mark 5, verse 7 through 9, it says, And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What do I have to do with you, Jesus? the son of the most high God. I implore you by God that you tor do not torment me. In verse 8, he said, it said unto him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. So, so here again, we see these demonic spirits trying to manipulate Jesus through calling him in as many names as he can. So what, 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 you know, what can we draw from that? We, we cannot use the name of Jesus to try to manipulate God. What we use the name of Jesus is to try to, is to, try to decree the will of God in the earth. We got to find out what his will is and we use that. And, 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 and we, if we're not careful, we can get over into witchcraft because we're trying to use the name of Jesus to carry out our will and not God's will. That's the basic tenet of witchcraft is, is trying to manipulate the spiritual world in order to get my way. No, we got to get his way and then we use that and his way is blessed. His way is the best. So we need to use his way. And then something else interesting if we keep, keep on reading the account that he had the spirits he cast them into the pigs and the pigs ran down and, and was strangled and drowned in the sea. In Luke's account, it says he had commanded the unclean spirits to come out. And that word commanded is in the Greek imperfect tense. And what that means is, is he was, it's in the continuous. He was commanding it to come out, but it wasn't coming out. Then he said, what is your name? And then when he found out his name, he was able to cast it out. So he had to identify it. It wasn't about the power of this demonic spirit. It was about the, he had to detect it first. And you know that's a, that's what that's where we get tripped up sometimes. It's not that the the demonic spirits are so powerful. It's because they try to go undetected, and until we locate them, 
that this is an actual demonic assignment in order to deal with it. A good example of that, and it actually points out several things. Actually, Brother Hagen was telling the story about Brother Goodwin. I mentioned him earlier. He was the one that said they had great times of fellowship together and stuff. But he had come to minister at his church, and when he came back, he noticed the atmosphere was more free where it was bound up before. He seemed like, It just seemed like you couldn't minister effectively in that church. Well, Brother Goodwin told him that he was in there praying one day. He was praying in the sanctuary, and through the manifestation, this is what the, the Bible calls discerning of spirits. He looked up, and he saw up through the rafters, and he saw this thing like a big baboon sitting up there. This big demonic spirit. So he said he called up to it. He said, hey, big fella, get down here. Get down from there. And he said it like swung down like an ape would. It grabbed a hold of the rafter and swung down and landed before him. He says, and he said, uh, uh, you're, you, he told it to leave. And that, that was what most of them, when he had this manifestation, they would always say, well, I really don't want to leave, but if you tell me to, I have to. He said, you have to, and said he ran out the door, and he, he, he looked out the door, and he saw, and it ran across the street into a bar called the Green Lantern, and within a few days, the, the bar burned down. There, there are several things that that illustrates. That illustrates that there was a problem in that church, but it wasn't until they lo he located the problem that he was able to address it. See, because, you know, we can, we can pass things off and we can say, well, it's just, you know, the people's not receiving or I'm just not on my game right now or whatever. And we can do all these things. So it took the Lord showing him what the problem was and where the, where the demonic assignment was. And we're talking about spiritual atmospheres. It had affected the atmosphere of that church. But once he located it, he was able to cast it out. And there was no, you know, it wasn't a long struggle. It wasn't any of that thing once he located it. And also notice from both the demoniac of Gadara, soon as those demons went in those hogs, it destroyed them immediately. It destroyed their life immediately. And as soon as that demon went into that bar across the street, it burned down. And that just shows you, you know, the preserving nature even of the believer. And, well, first of all, because that was a human... In a human being, you know, it wasn't able to exact as much destruction it was. And that just shows you what authority innately we have as human beings. That this guy had managed to survive however long it had been with this demonic spirit. And even more so in a church setting. So even though it had messed with the atmosphere, it wasn't able to bring about as much destruction in the church as it was the bar across the street. That's why it pays to be as close to God as you can. You know, the, you know even, even when it's a blind spot and we're missing it, at least there, we have God's preserving hand on it.